Hey everybody, absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. We should do like one of those force perspective things where we all look like we're miniatures. Do you like that scene in Fast Five or Fast Six when The Rock and Vin Diesel have to be at the cookout together and neither one of them is allowed to look <laughs> taller than the right. other for more than one shot? They have to have an equal number of shots where they look as tall as each other and the camera angles just go fucking bananas. Yes, I know exactly what clip, you're talking right? about. Yeah, It's wild. The contractual egotism it's become part of the series and a positive part of it. The toxic masculinity of it all. Do the Tom Cruise stand on an apple crate. So I saw it yesterday and it was definitely one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, but not so much the movie. I want to talk about 4DX, the theater experience. Yes, please. Which theater did you go to? There's a new one in NoHo. There's that shopping center that popped up out of nowhere. Oh yeah, that like fancy-ish It's like one. super, yeah, it's one of those ones where it's like live where you shop, shop where you live, die where you shop. Yes. Oh fuck, where it's got like the apartments over the deal like at the Americana. And it's kind yeah. of got, it's like very clean looking. It's got some wood type modernist kind Yeah, of it's thing. very, I don't know. Over the last 20 to 30 years, I feel like when you look at the architecture of America, it's like, oh, the mid-century architects were onto something. What if we just reduce that to the point where we don't even understand why it is what it is? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like beyond minimalism into, I don't know, I just heard if you make a box, it good. If you do box <laughs> in like a long rectangle window, it's yeah. going to look like shit, but it's going to look clean. What if two box <laughs> and they're offset a little bit, one box white, other box dark accent color, yes. you live here, it fall apart. And then you get the residential thing where it's like, I don't want to see my neighbors. I don't want to touch my neighbors. Just yeah. like solid fence surrounding the box. So I had a friend whose husband, I want to say he moved over here from Syria. And when he came over here and they started like looking at places he actually like saw the Americana and the Grove, you know, these like yeah, yeah, old yeah. school, they're made to look like old Main Street USA, but they're just a giant mall. And then there's giant faux luxury apartments oh. above them. And they all have like a big fountain in the middle and they're constantly playing like big band music yeah, outside. Sinatra style yeah. stuff, yes. And he wanted to move there so badly. To the Americana. Yeah, he was like, this is it. This is what uh -huh. I pictured it would be like when I came yeah. here and I want to live here. And I'm not saying that like everybody in Syria pictures it this way. I'm just saying this particular guy saw it and was like, this is what I wanted out of America. This is America. Oh. And I was like, are you going to? to stay with him. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, when Twerp would visit from Canada before they moved here, they did the same thing. You really? <laughs> yes. They, all they wanted to do was go to the Americana. One time they were, they were visiting, they on purpose booked a hotel on brand I just so they it. could be near the America. I love it. So it's not just like, oh, I come from Syria. It's like, I come from not America. I come from not America. And he just yeah. genuinely was like, no, I love this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like me in this fast movie where I love all of these movies. Right. And it's not an ironic love. It's just a different kind of love than I have for good, good movies. movies. Yes. Yes. You know? yeah. <laughs> they're perfect and they're stupid and they're wonderful. They're exactly what they're trying to be. They're not trying to be anything more than that. They hit their own mark. They hit the quarter mile mark, baby. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Stoked to like be at the Americana would be movie theater right there of like, huh, I'm bored. I'm going to step outside and watch a film. I mean, that's kind of the cool thing about it. I can specifically see people moving to a big city and moving to something like this. And it's like, it looks nice. They keep it clean. Yep. There's a movie theater right there. There are four restaurants right here. Yeah. This is good. When we moved here and Audrey was little, like not even two, Rachel would just take her there because it's a big fountain that plays music. You can mm -hmm. dance around all day. Oh, there are always kids like out playing. Yeah. It's, it's actually amazing for little kids. They oh, and they, they have the streetcar that doesn't go anywhere and it goes, yeah. it goes nowhere at four miles an hour. Yep, that's right. So it, even though it's not going anywhere, it's still going too slow. I remember the first time I, I came to LA, I was like, where does this go? And they're like, literally just right over there. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turns, like you can see it, 50 yards down right there. And I was like, we can walk there faster. Like, yeah, that's not the point. Are You're you a child? <laughs> Why do you want to get on the street? I don't know. I'm not from here, man. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes it's not even moving. Like it just, 
literally stationary. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's just there as like a, an Americana prop, is like a nostalgic mid-century remember streetcars. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Remember streetcars. And kids are, and we're all like, no, we don't. I was very confused by the cupcake vending machine as so, well. So, the cupcake vending machine. Oh, a wistful tone you've struck. So Sprinkles, I don't know if it started in New York, but it was in New York yeah. before it was in L.A. Right. Like, as in a Magnolia is popular, we should jump on this cupcake Yeah, thing, like yeah. when New York just decides on things that they're into, and they don't really think about why. It's just yeah. like, for the next six months, we really like cupcakes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, why? It's like, I don't know. We just do cupcakes. Yep. But they had, like, the really nice cupcake places, and I want to say they tried to open the cupcake ATM in New York. Mm -hmm. It did not work. You're overdrawn. You can't. <laughs> it was vandalized. You haven't deposited <laughs> enough cupcakes? smashed up it was like a five cupcake atm fee to get one cupcake out <laughs> and it was just like this doesn't even make sense but the one in la they were just like oh yeah they had to shut that down for a while and i was like why they're like because rats live in there because there's cake and it's unwrapped <laughs> like it's what? just cake yeah there were just like rats and vermin living inside of it in the sprinkles cupcake in the sprinkles ATM. cupcake atm because they're not like hermetically sealed or anything in that they're just like from the bakery to the atm it's not liable if it's true by the way at that point just turn it into a vermin vending machine press a button and it gives you a little mouse oh my yeah. gosh there's a art installation somewhere right now that's just an all-white vending machine with like fine china in it and when you put money in, the little roller unrolls and just a plate falls and breaks. <laughs> and I was just like, art is the best. Do you remember the, the <laughs> yeah. art exhibit that was the blenders with the goldfish? Yes. What? I can't remember where this was. Some modern art museum. And it was uh, an exhibit that was a bunch of, let's say, 10 plugged in blenders, tops on, filled with water, each of which had a live goldfish in it. And it was just like, what are we going to do here? Went on for a while until one day some kid just went, bam, 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 bam. <laughs> and turned them all on at the same time. The, the punishment is that you have to make the child drink it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's the move. You've committed crimes against art. Drink <laughs> the fish smoothie. <laughs> was it Tilda Swinton who was living in a box? Yeah. In a museum for a while? She lived in a box in a museum, I want to say, for like 30 days or something. It was something. a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like David Blaine long, but it was a while. Yeah, which, to be fair, sounds like something she would normally do. Tilda Swinton's one of those people where I'm always trying to figure out whether I think she would be the coolest to spend a day with or whether I would be exhausted. Could go either way. Yeah. She's either amazing or intolerable. Yeah. <laughs> She's one of those people where it probably depends on like the group of people around her. Yes. Like if you hang out with like her and Jim Jarmusch, it's probably like the worst <laughs> time you've ever had in your life. I feel like you need to have people with eyebrows to balance out the lack of eyebrow. Like you need mm -hmm. like a Zachary Quinto kind of situation where it's like we're all compensating brow yeah. wise. Anytime you're having like too much of like a just a hoity toity conversation, check for the number of eyebrows. <laughs> if it's too few eyebrows, get yourself a Quinto. I just rewatched Ghost Dog. Yes. Have you seen that recently? Oh, I lo fucking love Ghost Dog. Have you Dog. seen Ghost Dog? What's Ghost Dog? Oh, what's Ghost Dog? Ghost Dog is a Jarmish movie from the late 90s, early 2000s, starring Forrest Whitaker. He's a hitman, but he obeys kind of a uh, samurai code. Yeah. The full title is Ghost Dog, The, the Way, Way of the, of the samurai. samurai. And Forrest Whitaker is a samurai in the Bronx. Yes, that's exactly right. So this guy, this mobster, saved his life as a young man or as a kid or something, maybe a teenager. And then he kind of went away for a while and then he comes back and he's like, you have saved my life. I'm at your service. Tell me what you want. And the guy's like, okay, I'll ask you to kill people. And Forrest Whitaker is like, yep. Luckily, I trained in that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't go away and like train in uh, accounting yeah. and convenient. like come back and be like, you saved my life. Do you need an accountant? Yeah. Not really. It's pretty great. There's also, who's the guy in the ice cream truck? Is he Haitian? Remember this guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can't speak to each other. So one guy only speaks French. That's Forrest Whitaker's best friend. He only speaks French. He's Haitian. Forrest Whitaker doesn't speak French. And they just kind of vibe at each other. <laughs> they learn deep lessons in life from one another, though they cannot speak to each other. Yeah. It's a bit that was actually reused on the television series The New Girl. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. The guy, Nick, on The New Girl, Jake Johnson, his best friend was this old Chinese man that he found in the park and they couldn't speak to each other. But whenever he sat down next to this guy and they couldn't speak to each other, he would walk away like with a great philosophical lesson. And I was like, he took that from Forrest Whitaker. Just two guys vibing. That's sort of the trend right now. Vibing and thriving yeah. and surviving. That's my new live, laugh, love. Say it again so we can get it clean. Vibing, thriving, surviving. Can you say it like you mean it? 
No. Great. You know I can't do that. <laughs> Can you put it on a piece of Ray Dunn pottery? With like really curly font? What yes. is yeah. with this specific font? You both know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. It's like the heavy, like line weight variation. The wine mom font, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the phenomenon of the casual alcoholic glamorization of mom signs. Yeah. Where it's like, don't talk to me till I've had my wine. Yeah. yeah. My dad made one and sent it to me. I'm really proud of him for like editing this photo, but it just said, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> in that font? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it is. Or I have a drinking problem. <laughs> this is not going to be a good story, and I'm going to preface it with that. Do you have an estimated runtime on it for the people at home? 30, 45 minutes. Okay, great. So just skip ahead 45 minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, all right, cut here. <laughs> 45 minutes later, I'm going to continue my story. It was something about how, you know, the morals have really switched in the last... 30 or so years. Like, we used to drink a ton. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a piece in The Atlantic about how Americans drink. Go off, old man. Basically, before whatever, 1900, everybody was drunk all the time. Mm -hmm. If you go really early, like colonial America, people drank whatever the fuck it was, beer more than they drank water, just because it was safer. Yeah. And then we got drunker and drunker and drunker. And then prohibition kind of hit, and we got a lot less drunk. Mm -hmm. And then things have been getting drunker and drunker and drunker since then. And now alcoholism is kind of a virtue with this wine mom yeah. vibe. I mean, I even have a couple of friends who like have like those gets wine o'clock shirts and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow. Unironically? Kind of unironically. It's a fast and furious sort of thing with yeah. them yeah, yeah. where it's like, <laughs> no, I genuinely mean it. And I know it's stupid, but I do mean it. We lived in England for a while and there people just drink like insane amounts compared to what we do here. It's ridiculous. And it, it, it would, it's not you know, atypical for people to have four or five drinks a night or mm-hmm. whatever. It's like, uh, which is like, I can't do that anymore. The, no. I, the wine stuff is like a great way to broadcast that you have a headache at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I like red wine a lot. I love a good red wine. Sure. The thing when you wake up in the morning and your lips are just like cracked and purple and it's like, this is not going to oh, come out. So that's fun. how you know it's going to be a good day. Or yeah, <laughs> or if you're you at know. a party and you finally go to the bathroom and you're like, I look like I've lost my entire mind. Well, I've never liked being drunk, but of course being hungover sucks. But when you get old, Leighton, it's a lot easier to get hungover. Mm. Like, when did it start to get really bad? After 30 or so? I feel like maybe even mid-30s. Probably around 30. Yeah. I also just started slowing down naturally around that time. totally, totally. So there have been very few times where I've been like ridiculously hungover. I think Same. once I started taking my ADHD and depression and anxiety medication as an adult, I was like, oh, I'm not drinking seven cups of coffee a day. I'm not going out and doing 10 shots at the bar. It's a lot I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm just like, oh, I, that's what they mean when they say self-medication. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> I have three claws now and wake up with a hangover. You call white claws claws? They're just the claw. The claws, the, claws. the law. And now there's straw claws, which is a pretty good flavor. It's strawberry. Oh, I thought you meant you drink them with the straw, which well, seems a lot You can sadder. always put a silly straw in a claw. That's true. Then it's a silly claw. That's the law. I had a wild experience this weekend with friends where they brought out the 4th of July Oreos, which are red, white, and blue. Mm-hmm. But they also have Pop Rocks in them. Oh, God. It's the texture of fireworks. I yes. love it. So that sounds disgusting. It works somehow. But it wasn't until I took a sip of White Claw after eating it that I realized all the Pop Rocks get stuck in your teeth (laughs) and then they all started going off at once like when you do baking soda and vinegar. Your mouth starts fizzing and like you're somebody in a horror movie that's about to go zombie. (laughs) And it stayed for like a while. I was stoned as fuck. And every time I drank, I was like, what's happening? (laughs) Well, we were all part of the era where you couldn't do like a marathon charity stream of any kind, unless there was like a lot of drinking as Mm -hmm. both an audience incentive and a punishment. Yes, that's right. And it was one of those things where I think we all sort of realized after a couple years where we were looking at the amount of time and it wasn't the time that was the problem. We were like converting time into drinks (laughs) and we were just like, no, I don't want to do this. Like, I know it's for charity, but like, I don't know. (laughs) Wreck your liver for charity. Yeah, I mean, fuck them kids. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I can't do this. Will will you play that right to camera? Hey, fuck them kids. I ain't got time for that. You know my famous catchphrase. Yeah. (laughs) You're always saying it. I'm always saying it. (laughs) It's weird because you start every single conversation. I did interrupt him, so I want to get a full phrase clean again, right to camera. Sorry. Fuck them kids. I ain't got time for that. And then it would normally be like, yeah, exactly. Zoom in. 
yeah. the camera's going to be tilted as it comes in. I would hold in. for just a second. That's right. Hold for applause. Remember, they, they used to have the doll with the pull string. Of course. I still have a crate of those in my garage. You know what? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I give them out at conventions. <laughs> you got that one set to evil. <laughs> <laughs> the Frogert is also cursed. <laughs> Brian, what the fuck are you doing? Jeremy Renner, reopen your app. Okay. Brian didn't know about the app. Hold on. There's a pull string Pee Wee Herman doll right there. Dude, he's jerking off in there. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> he paid good money to be alone in the dark in there. <laughs> so... All good pull string dolls deteriorate. So when you pull that thing, mm -hmm. and you can't understand what it's saying, it used to go, hello, I'm Pee Wee Herman. But now it goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's fucking great. Like when Pee Wee Herman talks to you in a dream. Yes, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> also, leave Pee Wee alone. He made a mistake. He made a mistake that, come on. But it's I do no think deal. whenever he's alone in the dark, he's probably jerking off. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we most all? of us are, <laughs> and so it's not like we can't really be mad at. You'll Peter notice how well that. lit this garage is. Mm -hmm. That's to prevent myself from jerking off in here. That <laughs> One way, it's of the lights not dark is a enough. UV light, and when you turn it on, <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure it is. Remember the amount of stuff that Twerp and I and NSP have done in here is mm -hmm. we've done some horrible things. Listen, the creative process <laughs> it's a is, disgusting a, is thing. a different thing for different people. You just got to let artists be artists. That's right. And all artists are just constantly masturbating. All art is masturbation. So it's that true. Tracks. All art is cum. <laughs> Finally, how long has it been since we've actually talked about cum in an episode? We always end with it. Hey. With me embarrassed. Where's the bell? Ring the cum bell. What? Okay, this was an interesting creative decision that you decided that that specific sound is the cum bell. Yeah, couldn't let the full symbol happen. Had to be the muted symbol. It also makes no difference. The symbol's having some erectile dysfunction problems. I used to have a big uh, like <laughs> hotel <laughs> desk spell. There it is. That pause was very strategic. I actually think that sound comes from a fully erect symbol. It's the mm. longer, wobblier sound that comes from a flaccid That's true. symbol. The crash is in a thing over there. Whatever. Was it next to your Pee Wee Herman doll? Please go uh, <laughs> retrieve everything for me. Your daughter wasn't here when I came over today to show me all of her all of her possessions. Please do. So I'm just going to go through. Anthony, have you seen my VHS collection? Come here. But that is my favorite thing about kids. I immediately have a good impression of you because they won't do it to somebody that they don't have a good impression of. No. Nope. But if a kid has a good impression of you, it's like, let me show you all of my things. I have so little. Oh. <laughs> I have so little and everything that I have has to be gifted to me yep. because I have no means to get it on my own. So please let me show you all of my worldly possessions. hundred percent. And it's amazing. And then you're their best friend. Mm -hmm. The last time I was here, she has these little things. They're Shopkins, right? Yes. They're little tiny foods. To the point that, like, I want some. They're so cute. They've got little faces on them, and then they have, like, fun glitter. They're like little vinyl toys, but they look specifically like food. Yes, specific actual brands. So mm -hmm. it's just like, let's indoctrinate you yeah. to the brand. Oh, it's so upsetting to me. Because they don't just have one thing per brand. It's like they have 20 different flavors of Briar's ice cream. So tell me about the personalities of these food. Non-existent. Because the brand, right? Like, if it's a brand with a face on it, like Cheetos probably do like the DreamWorks eyebrow. They all look exactly the same as far as I can tell. Really? Yeah. There's like very little personality to the faces. What's interesting are the different packagings. So like there's a popsicle. So they have like bomb pops mm -hmm. and they have some other popsicle. It's a little bit melted. They have cereal and this is an insane choice. So they have the packaging and then the thing inside the packaging. So the packaging doesn't have the eyes. It doesn't have the face. The thing inside does. Right. It emerges from its cereal chrysalis. Yes. Well, the cereal is crazier. So first cereal, what has the face? Can you guess? So there's a little box of, let's say, Apple Jacks. So it's not going to be the box. We already know that. It's not the box. I don't think it's going to be the bag. Is it each individual jack? It's the bag. The bag. And then you take the bag out of the box and it's transparent with a face on it. And then inside are the kernels. What's the word I'm That's looking for? Brilliant. Nuggets of cereal. So this would be like if you went to a sixth grade Apple Jack science class, the teacher would have up at the front of the classroom, mm -hmm. probably one of those that's like a cutaway section. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Anatomy of a cereal. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, this is what we're like on the inside. It's like, ew, gross. <laughs> There's no way I fit that many jacks inside of me. We're all going to dissect a jack. You came so close to a Henry portrait of a cereal joke. Oh my God. And didn't make it. I can't believe I didn't go for that. Also, by the way, that movie fucking sucks. It's it terrible. Sucks. It's awful. And it's such a promise too, where it's like, oh, this could possibly be good and fucked up. And it's such a goddamn drag. Best movie that's about the personality of a serial killer. Man Bites Dog. Man Bites Dog. Or The Vanishing. Not the 
Jeff Bridges one. That one fucking sucks. Yeah. But the original, the original the 1989, The Vanishing, which yeah. I own on Criterion. You're not counting like a documentary or something. No, it's got to be fictional. So Mindhunter doesn't count. And it's not a movie, it's a series. No, because that's a series. It's based on real stuff. American Psycho. Uh, that's what I was going to say. For me, I think it's American Psycho or Woody Harrelson, Juliette Lewis, Natural Born oh, Killers. Natural Born Killers. Oh, that's fabulous. A one. Yeah. yeah. I got really obsessed with serial killers for a little while. Don't we all? Yeah. I was literally like doing another deep dive on BTK yesterday just because like I'm reading his daughter's book. She's not a great writer and it's just sort of like her describing idyllic memories with her father and at the end be like two weeks later he killed three people. And it's like, okay, I get it. You can do that once. Yeah. That's yeah. that's like an emotional reaction for me once. You can't do it every chapter. But also yeah. it's not like you start reading that book and then you're like, What? Yeah. He did? It's like he's <laughs> the lamest of the serial killers just because he's such a little bitch about everything. <laughs> like, he writes poems. He writes to the news, like, I don't understand why this isn't national news, and then gives them bunch a bunch of, like, here's what you could call me. And one of them's, like, the oh, yeah. poetic killer because he would write poems and send them. Like, oh, Anna, why didn't you appear? Real pick-me-killer energy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> pick-me-killer. I, I feel like with the the serial killer thing, r slash pick me killers, it was a whole thing, and then suddenly people were like, "Wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be super into this." Yeah, and then it kind of took a turn. I don't know. I think there are some people that are still super into it. I'm still super fascinated by it. Yeah, and I think particularly like teens, early twenties, like you do get fascinated. Yes. Yeah, because it's the internet. It's like I can see everything. I can learn everything about this. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first moved here and I was living in Los Feliz and I could walk to the house where like that murder suicide family, the Christmas murder where they're like, there's still the, the Christmas tree no. and like the gifts in the house, like in oh, Silver Lake. What is this? Yeah. This was this guy who was a doctor. Now you have my attention. Yeah. 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 He, <laughs> yeah. No, a real doctor, not a PhD. He oh, was a medical doctor. Oh, sorry. He did good know, things. I don't know if I've mentioned my doctorate recently. Uh, actually, not since I came in today and I was very impressed. It's right there on the wall. Oh, I've never noticed that that was there. I can't believe you didn't immediately point at it the first time I came in here. Yeah, I'm sorry to derail your story for no. this thing about my degree, but it's right there if you want to go look at it. For the people that are doing this on audio, we're going to be silent for the next 10 seconds because we are staring in awe and reverence at Brian's PhD. It's signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Shh. Why don't you lead with that? Lead with what? The PhD is less impressive than Arnold. Yeah, tell me you have Arnold Schwarzenegger's autograph. Don't tell me you have a PhD. <laughs> well, I, That's all it was every, for. Not everybody has Arnold Schwarzenegger's <laughs> autograph. That was the end game, really. That yeah, was the whole point right. of going to school. Me and 50,000 to 100,000 other people who graduated from UC between the years of whenever he was governor. Yeah. It's a good racket if you're in the autograph game. Yeah. That's a pick me PhD. <laughs> 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 okay, Anthony, tell us about this murder suicide. Oh, yes, so it was just my ex knew more about it than me because when we met, I was still pretty fascinated with serial killers, but I sort of like moved away from that because of ADHD. I have a hundred hobbies at any given time. And she was still very into it. I think that's just part of the culture right now is like if you're an American woman, you probably watch a lot of like murder shit. Like, yes. that's just the way it is right now. I mean, it's such a trope that there was a whole SNL song yeah. about it, right? Like, yeah. it's that mm. big thing where, like, if we were falling asleep to a podcast, like, if I picked it, it could be any number of things. They would all be nerdy and garbage. But if she picked them, they were all other women with soothing voices telling us about horrible murders. Yep. Right. I've been falling asleep to Dr. Todd Grande videos. His videos are dog shit. They're awful. But he has the most soothing voice as he's telling you about murders and stuff because he always does, like, an analysis of the personality that... It's just like, yeah, dude, we already know this. Like, this is not adding any new information. His name is Todd Grande. That seems like a fake name. He has a very soothing voice, so it's great to fall asleep to. And it's not like one of those things where it's like, hey, guys, what's going on? We're going to do top 10 murder suicides. You know, level. Is he a soothing. real doctor or is he like a Brian doctor? That's a good question. I think he's a real doctor. Okay. Which means he probably doesn't know anything about serial killers. Oh, wait, he's like a psychologist doctor? Yeah. Oh, that's not a real so doctor. So not a real doctor either. Yeah. If you don't cut people <laughs> open every day... Yeah, and save lives. Unless you're specifically a surgeon. The doctors in the audience are going to get so mad at us. Come at me, doctors. Dude, you don't want to tell a doctor to come at you. They got scalpels. Only the real ones. <laughs> and no real doctor is going to have a problem with my comment. That's a good point. The next time you go to a hospital, you're in the ER and they're going to be like, I know what you said, Anthony. <laughs> it's so funny because my brother was a surgeon. He's a pediatric cardiologist. So not a real doctor? Well, now he's in research. And so... 
now the other surgeons don't accept him anymore. Do you know about this thing? They used to think babies didn't feel pain. Yeah. How could they? Point to where on the baby feels Because the they pain. just cry all the time for no reason. Yeah. Babies so, don't know. Oh. It's like, okay, so we'll pierce their ears immediately. Or whatever, which, What yeah. a horrible practice. We're just now, within the last five years, publishing a lot of studies that are like, oh, it turns out animals might have thoughts and feelings. <laughs> oh, really? Animals. And like, these are people who like, will say like, I love my dog and my little dog lays on my lap and I will rub my dog's belly and my dog knows when I come home from work. And then if you ask him, it's like, no, animal don't have feeling. Yeah. Animal can't think. <laughs> on the other side of that, you get the people who are like, but plants also can think. If I have one more person tell me about the distributed mycelium network, oh. about like its intelligence. Well, that's because of Star Trek discovery. It's because probably. people read an internet headline at, or like maybe the first paragraph of it and they integrate that, the highest level of the concept. Yeah. And they go, oh, cool. And then they just tie it to whatever other garbage bullshit they think. And they're like, oh, That's this right. is like this. It's all connected, man. Hold on. We got to get back to the murder-suicide yeah, situation. So there's a murder-suicide situation. There was this doctor who killed his family and then himself. And it was in Silver Lake. And uh, there was one child, I believe, who survived and owned the house. You know, there was a crime scene cleanup of the house, but there wasn't any additional cleanup. And the child wouldn't return to the house in Silver Lake. And so for years- Oh, God. It was still a Christmas tree and you could see like gifts. It was like gated off. My ex and her friends, and she did this with me a couple times. She used to just love to like drive up to it and be like, oh my God, oh my God, it's right there. Oh my God. Whoa. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and like, it's so creepy. Ah, you know, like kids That's at a slumber nuts. party. Yeah. Oh my God. For my like 20 something birthday. I mean, you have three options, right? Shut up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went on one of those like murder tours where you get on the bus and they drive you around. And I was like, oh, it'll be fun. I'll get to see some stuff. It was a fucking nightmare. They drop you off at like cemeteries and they're like, go fuck off for 30 minutes. And then you feel like a disgusting piece of shit for going around being like, yeah, Hugh Hefner is buried here. Really fucking cool. That's not a murder tour. No, no. but then they're like, we're going to go to, you know, some places where people were murdered. Who are the two brothers who uh, killed their parents? Menendez. Menendez, yes. And the whole thing is they're like, so we can't take you to this one because we've gotten the cops called on us multiple times and if we go there one more time, our whole operation is going to get suspended. But just so you know, it's over that way. Like every place that was advertised that we'd go to, they'd be like, we can't go because we're going to lose like our license for this. That's so lame. Like, thank you for continually harassing these people who live at the sites of awful tragedies. I went on a couple like ghost or vampire or like murder in New Orleans because I used to go to New Orleans like twice a year. Yeah, yeah. And those can be pretty fun. And the nice thing about them is like if part of the tour is boring, there's like always a weird bar or gallery right across the street or like a place to get a good snack. And yeah. so if they're like, and in this house, like and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nah. Oh, beignets. <laughs> and then you go, you get a bag of beignets and you come back and you're like, great, are we moving on? This is perfect. And then every once in a while you get like the good story and you're like, hell yeah. How is New Orleans? Fucking dope, man. I've been like, twice. So I have family out there. So I used to go there a couple times a year. I never lived there for like a long period of time, but I've been there for like a couple weeks at a time. And it's fun. It's not for me. I wouldn't want to live there, you know, because there is a lot of that, like going back to what we were talking about earlier. It is a culture of casual alcoholism there. Yes, it seems that way. It really is. Savannah, Georgia is the same way. Mm -hmm. Hot Southern anything. Everybody's just drinking just to numb it. And you can just walk down Canal Street or whatever. Yeah, my sister used to be a one of the servers at the daiquiri bars. Oh, with the long... Yeah, one of the main ones on Decatur. They have like multiple locations. And she was one of the people that would serve daiquiris. And you can get them in a drive through <laughs> Insane. Yeah, all the law in New Orleans says is you can't put the straw in the cup. For them. You give them the cup, you give them the straw. I, in the driver's seat, can take the cup and straw. I cannot put the straw in the cup because that means I'm drinking it. Wow. Ah, uh, intent to drink. <laughs> intent to drink. I could simply be escorting a daiquiri in my vehicle. That's nuts. You strap it into its little daiquiri I, I car seat. Yeah, little seat. And what you want to do is you want to face the daiquiri seat backwards, not forward. It's safer that way. It's safer that way for the daiquiri. But no, it's great. And I feel like you dig on it a lot because the other thing that's the culture there is just like, 
it's all live music yeah, all, the, all time. the time. Yes. And incredible food. Yeah. It's good food. It's bars everywhere. It's a lot of goth culture, which I'm into. New Orleans has a big goth scene. Oh, it's so good, man. Really? Yeah, man. Like Haunted Mansion style stuff. I love that you go straight for Haunted Mansion. Well, because it's New Orleans Square. You're right. That's the only reason. Not because I'm a fake I goth. I mean, you're not wrong. But yeah, there's a lot of like goth bars that I'll go and hang out at there. My stepbrother used to live above a place called the Whirling Dervish on Decatur. Uh-huh. And the Whirling Dervish was like a big goth bar. And it was so funny because my stepbrother used to have this giant albino boa constrictor named Damien. <laughs> my stepbrother was this guy. His job used to be captaining the ship that would take oil crews out to the oil derricks to live there. Okay, yeah, yeah. So Whoa. he wouldn't be gone for six weeks at a time, but he would be gone for a few days at a time because mm-hmm. he would have to take the crew out there. Because you got to get out the canal. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. You yeah. got to get all the way out into the ocean where they ha- can actually safely have the derrick and like the drills and all that stuff. Drop off the crew. They live there for a few months. You go back. It takes about four days. And so in that time, sometimes, you know, you only have to feed snakes like once a week. Mm-hmm. Sometimes Damien would like get out of his aquarium and he would just go down and hang out in the Whirling Dervish. And they didn't hate it. They loved it. Of course. It's they bar. fucking loved it. They were like, Damien! <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and so like the bartenders had a key to my stepbrother's apartment. And they would hang out with Damien and then bring Damien back upstairs. <laughs> that is so fucking so how, cool. Describe Damien. How big? Ish. Damien was maybe like 10 feet almost. Damien was long. Mm. He was a long boy. But yeah, there's like a big goth culture. There's a bar that I used to go to that's up above this Chinese food restaurant. And when they would close, you'd go through the closed Chinese restaurant and up the back stairs to this place called the Dragon's Den, which was upstairs in an old mansion in New Orleans. And I used to go there and see, there was a band called the Klezmer All-Stars. That oh yeah, I know. It. Yeah, You know, know the Klezmer yes, All-Stars? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, every time they were in New Orleans, they would play yeah, yeah. at this bar. And so you could see like, maybe it's a punk show. Maybe it's Jewish music, yeah. Yeah, but the nice thing about the Klezmer All-Stars is like, I think one of them's Jewish. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a bunch of dudes from like all over the world. Because that music just rules. Yeah, I'm genetically wired for all Klezmer and Baltic music. Oh, I love it. When Beirut was popular, I was like, oh, my oh God. thank God. Oh, this elephant speaks to gun. Me. What a moment in time. I was thinking recently, too, it's very interesting that that Klezmer kind of minor scale mm-hmm. now dominates pop music. Like a lot of trap music is all that kind of, you know, very it does. Uh, it Eastern like Klezmer, you know, kind of kind of sound. It's not an arpeggio, but what is it called when you're just noodling or back and forth around on the scale like that, like they do in Klezmer? It's like, you know? Yeah, I would just call it, I don't know if there's a specific word for that, but if you're just playing diatonically in that scale, it's like half step, minor third, half step kind of. Play it, bastard. Fine. So, G minor like this. sort of sound is now dominant. Yeah, it doesn't just sound like every bar mitzvah I've ever been to, but it also sounds like maybe there's a vampire creeping up on you. Yeah. Maybe there's a monster down the hallway. That's all I want. Uh, Yeah, right? At all times. I need to constantly be looking over my shoulder and watching my neck. It's so good, man. And New Orleans just feels like a vampire will come out of somewhere if you hang out long enough. (laughs) I go a lot less now, but even as you kind of age out of like, oh my God, we just saw one band and it's 2 a.m. Let's go find where the next band is because Uh bars never have to close here. Is that true? They never have to close? They never have to close. Wow. If you have half a drink and the music's over and you hear a band like down there, you just take your drink with you on the street. You're allowed to go wherever you want with it. But then when you kind of age out of that or decide like, ooh, I don't need to do that anymore, there's also just like a huge art scene there and like a lot of galleries and like, you can spend like a whole day just like walking around, checking it out. It's awesome. So Rachel did comedy on a cruise boat for five, six months once uh, via Second City. So Second City had these sweetheart deals on Norwegian cruise lines. Uh, They don't do it anymore, but they would basically get a bunch of actors and you'd go out on a ship for four months or whatever. Is that dope or terrible? It was amazing for her. I just visited once, but they had such an amazing deal because a lot of time the crew on those ships is like, you know, that's not a great job. Yeah. But Second City negotiated that the comedians basically could behave like passengers. So they had to work. It was legitimately like four hours a week. It was nothing. They had to show up and do the shows. A lot of the other performers, like the dancers or whatever, also had to be greeters and do other jobs around the ship. Comedians didn't have to do anything else except show up, do the performance, and then they had to do one one thing, which was like 
they'd show a, a movie, like a retrospective best of second city. Mm-hmm. But she said that a lot of them would just make shit up and she'd be <laughs> like, and this is what, you know, famously uh, Belushi and Aykroyd went to space in 76. And when they got back from the moon landing, of course they were best friends with all the astronauts and people would just be, uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. Cool. Yeah. That's wow. So they had to do like a show like that and then a couple improv shows and that was it. That's and the rest amazing. of the time, if there were free spaces on excursions off the boat, they could just go for free. Oh. They could hang out. They got free meals. See, that's the thing is like cruise, you're always hearing about how most of the time a performer or a crew on a cruise ship, like the boat docks and they're not allowed to get off that's the right. ship. That's right. They have to stay on it. And even when they're not working, they have to do something else like you were saying around the ship. And it just sounds like being trapped in a mall for six months. That's right. Yeah. But the mall is like. It's moving around. But it's like a wavy mall. It's very close to vaporwave. It's just wave. That's the most important part. <laughs> Some people will tell you it's the vapor, but I enjoy the wave. (laughs) We've come full circle from the last time you were here. The New Orleans part was because they ported out of New Orleans. Nice. So she spent like two days a week there for several months and was obsessed with this one restaurant, Mothers. Yeah. The Mothers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was talking about this forever. And I never got to go there when I went to meet her on the boat in New Orleans. And then when NSP went back there on tour, I was like, all right, I got to go to Mothers. Because she said they had this sandwich that had debris on it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what debris is? It's just like a bunch of like garbagey junk. It's well that. <laughs> like, <laughs> but so they would cook, you know, this beef or whatever. Yeah. And then everything that fell off the beef while it was cooking. Yeah. They just would like yes. make a sauce out of. Yeah, it's the pork leavens. Yeah. Yeah. And they just dump it all over this sandwich. So you'd order a sandwich with horseradish it's, and yeah, debris. It's like the dirtiest form of au jus you could get in yes, your life. That's exactly right. That feels like the beauty of just pulling chicken skin off, like a little roasted chicken. Oh. It's yeah. nice and crispy. Ooh. Uh, whenever Audrey eats chicken, that's just skin. And we're like, honey, please. Just take a bite. As a food town, man, like you can go anywhere. And it's one of those places where it's like the dirtier, grosser, littler hole in the wall it is. You're like, oh, absolutely. I'll get a po' boy from there. And it comes out and it's just like more shrimp than there should be in the world. Yep. Like, and then they just like slather it with something. It's like, what is it? It's like, I don't know. We always make it. And it's like, okay, cool. If you always make it, I'll eat it once. Have you ever been to Broadview Seafood? Mm -mm. I told this story on our mini episode this week. Give money to our Patreon so you can hear it. But anyway, that was the place that our sound guy, when we toured through New Orleans, he was like, that's the jam. Got to take an Uber 15 minutes out of town. Oh, okay. It's in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Like, there's nothing else around it. That's the place we have to go. Right on. It was so great. You know, the big bags of, like, fish boil. Oh, yeah. Like, one of my favorite places to go to do crawfish boil was actually in a town that my family used to live in, which was called Gretna. And that's in Louisiana. Yeah. It was about 20 minutes outside of the city, and unfortunately, it got really decimated after Katrina, so most people moved away. But there was a place, it was literally just, like, in, like, a mini mall, like, in a little shopping center, like a strip mall, and you would go in, and the place was, like, clearly used to be some sort of an office. Like it had like the really thin blue carpet. Uh uh And you would sit at like a folding card table with like the fake wood finish. Broadview had the folding tables too. And they bring out like a big metal bucket and then inside that bucket is a garbage bag. Yes. And that garbage bag is full of crawfish that they just boiled. Yep. And you just tear them apart. That's what you do. And you sit around with your family and you tear apart crawfish and throw the, the guts and faces of crawfish into the refuse bucket. That's the bet. The yeah. refuse bucket. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Is there a place to get that food out here? Oh, I don't know. Actually, you know what? There's a boiling crab mm-hmm. somewhere. I think there might be a couple of them. We went there and it was pretty good, but you know, it's not the same. No, I mean, every city you go to has like whatever their thing is. And when I think of LA, I definitely think of like the classic LA diner or deli. Deli, definitely. You could go to an LA diner and you're just like with the fucking phone book as a menu. Yeah. And that's what I think of when I think of LA. Absolutely. But, you know, being from New Jersey, Mm -hmm. you get spoiled. LA diners are fine. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not New Jersey diners. My fucking favorite diner in LA closed over the pandemic, so I'm heartbroken. What was your favorite diner? Nick's Diner. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just one of the ones with the U counter where the kitchen's kind of in the middle and back and all the waitresses call you baby and they just had great. Yeah, I love that shit. I'm glad uh, Philippe's made it. Philippe, the yeah, original. Yeah, yeah. Because that's right by there, right? Yeah. Nothing hits better than diner food. Like a good diner with like I, shitty coffee. Oh, dude, I was too blocks away at my old apartment from that intersection that has the house of pie on it. On Vermont? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you've got the house of pie and then you've got that diner right across the street from it. Yes. Is that diner solid? 
It's really good. Okay. It's really good. And they're open really late. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, Fred 62? Fred 62. Thank you. And so you could go to Fred 62 and then right across the street from that, right before I moved, like a really good little taco place. Yes, that's right with the the window. Yeah, Yeah, it's just a taco window. Right next to the movie theater. And it was just like, you would walk down and you'd be at this epicenter. It was like my version of living at the Americana. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You had the fucking tacos there. You had the diner food there. You had the house of pies there. And then right next door, you had Skylight Books. Yes. Yeah, and like movie theater. I love that movie theater. You have like that old school French restaurant over there too. That everybody always eats yes. at. Oh, yeah. That was a good intersection. That's a great block. Actually, I go over there for Skylight. That's been our go-to, like, order books during the pandemic. Yeah. Really? That's Bookstore. Great. I love Skylight. If you went from my place, you would pass Glenn Danzig's house, the one that he doesn't take really? care of. Really? Hey. Hey. Yeah, so Glenn Danzig <laughs> famously owned, he finally sold it, owned two houses in LA. He owns- The La Bianca. Yeah, Lucy and Desi's. Oh. Does he really? He owns their old mansion, yeah. He bought it at like the height of Danzigness. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. He owned that mansion. And then he owned this big place, this house in Los Feliz, like he never came to and he never took care of. He literally had a car out on blocks, like a charger out on blocks because it was like Danzig's like fuck around house. Yeah. <laughs> and so as Los Feliz started getting fancier and fancier, the homeowners association started like, hey, Mr. Danzig, uh, <laughs> you're not allowed to have that. And he was like, you know what though? I'm Glenn Danzig and I feel like being an asshole to you. So what if instead of fixing up the house, I actually treat it like shit and never live here? So he kind of did it on purpose. Just there was literally them. a tree growing into the fucking second floor of the house before he moved and he refused to sell it. He was like, no, I own it. And they Amazing. would just keep finding him. And he's like, I don't care. I'm Glenn fucking Danzig. Yeah, I can afford it. Here's money. Did you hear? They just played mother on the radio. Here's your fucking yeah. <laughs> homeowners association check. What's temperature check on misfits? I understand why people like them. To me, I've never really responded to that style of music. I had a roommate that was really, really into them. And I Want Your Skulls used to be like my bar is closing jukebox song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's always good to like bounce around to. I love the iconography and the culture around the Misfits a lot more than I enjoy listening to the Misfits. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way about the Ramones. Mm -hmm. Although the Ramones, that stuff is so corporate now that it's just ridiculous. But so is the Misfits stuff to some extent. Yeah, for sure. Like the branding, they really just like went nuts with it. I really yeah. love Misfits, but Glenn Danzig, I would love to punch in the face. Yes. So my favorite thing is, did you ever read Henry and Glenn Forever and Ever? No. No. Henry and Glenn Forever, and then there was a follow, Henry and Glenn Forever and Ever was this, I forget who the cartoonist was, but it was a graphic novel that presupposed what if uh, Henry Rollins and Glenn Danzig... <laughs> were a domestic partnership and they loved each other very much and what would their life be like? That sounds amazing. And it was really, really good. And I have both volumes of it. I should lend it to you because you'll love it. And it's just like this little short, like, you know, the kind of comics you would find in the back of zines and stuff. Yeah. Where it was like four pagers about like, what are Henry and Glenn doing this week? And famously, Henry Rollins really loved it. Glenn Danzig fucking hated it because he's an asshole. That tracks. He's an asshole. I mean, Henry Rollins is also an asshole, but I guess less. But in a different way. In like a fun way. Yeah, he's a fun douchebag. My my favorite version of that is there's that comic that's Bart Simpson and for, son from Family Guy. The fuck is his? Oh. Uh, uh, son from fa- hold Seth, on, Seth Green. Peter and not Stewie. Griffin. And Br- why? Oh, wow. Davy <laughs> Davy Ma- Boy. Hold on. None of Davey Boy Stewie. Griffin. Meg. Meg. Peter. Peter. Stewie. Stewie. Brian, Brian Dog. Lois. Lois. And Seth Green. <laughs> is it Seth? No, but Seth Green does the voice. It is Marky Boy. This is <laughs> astonishing <laughs> that we can't remember. Stevie, Stevie Ray Griffin. <laughs> we can't. Lil, no one look this up. Lil Lord Fauntleroy Griffin. <laughs> D- Dave, I'm going to throw out names. Joe. Old Slim. Mark. Joey Joe what, Joe name more? Shabadoo. <laughs> Fanny, there's Quagmire. Leon. Yeah, Quagmire. Cleveland. Cleveland. And who's Patrick Warburton is Joe? Is Joe the name of that character? Uh, and then also the son whose name is <laughs> Mario? I, I cannot believe this. Is Luigi. It? Okay, Wario Griffin. It's got to be like a real Anglo sounding. Waluigi Griffin. What about, aren't they vaguely Irish? Sure. <laughs> Aloysius T. Griffin. Let's go through different letters. A. No, it's a consonant. B. 
It feels like it's a concept, Chris. right? Chris. Chris. Thank Chris. You. It's Chris. It's, it's Chris. Chris Griffin. Wow. Anyway, it's Chris Griffin and Bart Simpson, and they're in couples therapy talking about their shitty dads. Oh, I and love it's that. a great comic. It's so good. Uh, Chris still sounds wrong. Though. No, it's Chris. No, but you're right. How long did it take for us to. <laughs> That was about three to five minutes. That was 17 and a half years of my life. Also, guys, check this out. Uh, I wear a calculator watch every day, but now that it's hot out and I'm in the sun, I have like... <laughs> a calculator watch tan. <laughs> yeah. You're officially the coolest. Wow. If this was a late 80s movie, we would have to push you into a locker right now. With that Pee Wee Herman doll. Ugh. Push me in a locker. Yeah, that's the new step on me, mommy. Just yeah. like... Push me in a locker, daddy. <laughs> 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 what is your relationship with Revenge of the Nerds? So, when I was a youth, I visited my Uncle John here in L.A. When I must have been five years old. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he worked for 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. And I got to take a tour of the studio and watch Revenge of the Nerds. Pre-release. Yeah, I got to watch it in a private theater as like a five-year-old. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> and so I was like, wow. And it was like a private screening room where like he pushed the button and the movie started. Like he told somebody like, yeah, cue up the movie. And like they just fucking did it because there was a guy who was on call to queue up movies all day. Yeah. Uh, and it was very cool and I loved it a lot. And a fully R rate. Have you seen this? No, I know. I know the whole deal. Yeah, right, yeah. it is fully gross. Yeah. Has not aged well. Ooh. Oh yeah. Aged the worst. Yes. Great movie for a five-year-old. Yeah, it's <laughs> fun. Like, listen, you're allowed to essay somebody if you're a nerd you deserve it oh, just <laughs> off yeah. you deserve it because of the way you were treated for your nerdiness yes uh and so like maybe you could even like blow up a building it's yeah. fine yeah. if you know enough science to blow up a building you're allowed yeah because yeah. everybody around you is dumber that's the walter white yeah, yeah pretty much yeah the revenge of the nerds walked so walter white could run <laughs> <laughs> guys vernon sent me these youtube videos that are like edits of Breaking Bad that are like Walter White's Sigma mindset. Oh, God. And there's one for Hector Salamanca, too, and they're so... That's really funny. I was it's losing so my mind last night because they end with, like, the maxim of just, like, Sigma mindset, shit yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I was obsessed with Revenge of the Nerds yeah. in high school. Interesting. That makes sense. I mean, like, at the time, that was what movies were. Yes. Every movie was, we've been picked on for too long and we're too sweet to be picked on. And so now we get to do a disproportionate amount of harmful crime. Yes. <laughs> like <laughs> Another movie in that genre, which really sucks, is The Mask. Yes. Which, that guy fully fucks people up in a very uncool way. Yeah, no, Stanley's not a good boy. He's a complete asshole. Yeah, but it's fun. He's the... dancing with cops. And... Yeah. I was obsessed with I was the mask. obsessed with the mask when Same. I was a kid. Yes. Cameron Cuban Diaz. Pete. Cuban Pete. Yes, thank you. He's the king of the rumba beat. <laughs> <laughs> the CGI in that movie when it came out it was, was wild. like... I am looking at a cartoon character in the real world. Fully. Yeah. It was insane. It's Jim Carrey going off. Like, it's delightful. For the time. For the time. For the time. Because we have to remember that the early Jim Carrey oeuvre, like, that whole thing is not Ace good. Ventura. The twist in Ace Ventura is that somebody's trans. Yeah. Yes, That's the terrible. twist. Yeah. It's fucking egregious. That's the twist is you murdered because you're trans. Yes. That's the joke. Isn't like, that hilarious? Ooh. I have to say, people were obsessed with that movie. I was obsessed with The Mask. Yeah. Love The Mask. The Ace Ventura stuff did not do anything for me, even at the time. Ace Ventura had bits that I was obsessed with. Some good moments. Like in the second one where he's like crawling out of the rhino, I think is one of like the most hilarious visual gags. And it looks like the rhino is the fake yeah. rhino that he's hiding in a Trojan rhino. He's like watching somebody from the inside of a fake rhino and he starts boiling because like the second one's set in Africa mm -hmm. and he starts pulling off his clothes because he's like sweating and he can't get out of the fake rhino because yeah. it's locked. <laughs> and so he has to like crawl his way out of the back of the rhino. Uh -huh. It looks like the rhino is giving birth to Jim Carrey. Wow. If you watch that as a child at the right age, yeah. it is the funniest shit in the world. It is yeah. I so think funny. the better iteration on the bit is the Always Sunny Christmas episode where yes. Danny DeVito yes. climbs naked out of the couch. That's a really good one. That's a really good bit. I will say the early Jim Carrey movie that does hold up and still rules is Cable Guy. Yes. Cable Guy is good. Cable Guy fucks. Which now, like, is even better than it was. Can we just say that Ben Stiller was usually about four years ahead of his time? 100%. The Always. Ben Stiller show is great. Everything that's on TV now, that whole style of, like, yes. cut to a reference or do a weird pop culture mashup, like, is because Ben Stiller was like, what if we did this on TV? Yeah, totally. Wow. Very influential. And a murderer's row of comedy people mm -hmm. on that, too. Bob Odenkirk looking yep. young. 
Yeah. yeah. Sarah Silverman, right? Sarah Silverman was Brian there. Brian Posehn, I think. Was he on that? I conflate that in Mr. And Mr. Show, Show a lot. Yeah. yeah. Main four were Ben Stiller, Janine Garofalo, Garofalo. Andy Dick, which was unfortunate. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. I feel like every other day I think of the image of John Lovitz beating the shit out of Andy Dick for getting Phil Hartman's wife back on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I already love John Lovitz, but just like, good for him. Everybody in LA has a real creepy Andy Dick story too. I bet. Yeah. We had an early episode where Brian was like, Andy Dick did nothing wrong not knowing about Andy Dick's Whoa. history. Yeah, no, I, I thought, again, not knowing anything. I was like, oh, he just has a substance abuse problem. Not realizing that it's... Far, far worse. Yeah, no. He has an abuse, abuse problem. Yes. Rachel and I were just talking about what a great show The Critic is. Oh, Speaking so of good. John Lovitz, people don't talk about it much anymore because it, it was kind of in the Simpsons shadow for mm -hmm. a long time, but it fucking rules. It's so funny. You know, like every show, no matter how much it sticks with you, like if it was a show that you watched, like there's probably one bit that yep. you can remember. Yep, yep, yep. And the bit that I think of whenever I think of The Critic is there's a part where a woman asks him like, oh, well, why don't you come over for dinner? When are you free? And he opens up his planner and it's a five day layout planner. And Monday says manic and Tuesday says depressive and Wednesday <laughs> says manic and Thursday says depressive. And I remember seeing that as a kid and being like, that is the most hilarious fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I still think of that gag like weekly. That show just had a lot of really great writing. Mm -hmm. Lovitz is incredible in it. He's good in everything. I'm so He's happy to see him. Like I was watching something where they were talking about the Phil Hartman SNL sketch where he's playing Reagan and like acts really dumb in front of reporters and then immediately yeah, yeah, yeah. goes full like right. super villain. Yeah. As is accurate. But John Lovett's just showing up. It just brings me joy. It's so good. I used to have a t-shirt. It was Mount Rushmore, but they had removed Thomas Jefferson and placed just John Lovett's. <laughs> and underneath it, it just said, what about John Lovett's? Question mark. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> I think so often of the opening scene from Happiness 1998 mm -hmm. uh, or 97. Fuck. But yeah, just like <laughs> you are shit. I am champagne. Yeah, man, that movie's good. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, sometimes you're talking to people and you just go, that was formative, huh? Yeah. I think we should move on to some segments. We started a segment with Anthony, who he did the theme song for, that I feel like we've touched maybe once. What? In the interim. Is this true? Yes. Yeah. What are your subs? Tell me your subs. This is about Reddit. What are your subs? Tell me your subs. We did with Jay Novella. Yes. I think. And then otherwise haven't done it. How do you remember things that we say on this podcast? Because I, I go into a fugue state and remember well, nothing. I remember you and Jay talking about Reddit. But yes, we haven't done it much. But yeah, we have the theme song for a segment that we've basically never used that you sang. The fucking Panini. The fucking Ponderosa, y'all. The fucking athlete's foot that we all had over the last year. I literally thought about when I was on your show. And in my mind, it was like eight months ago. But it can't have been less than it was February. 16 months ago. Yes, it was February yeah. 2020. The Panini. Had to be, right? Ugh! <laughs> Ugh! Yeah. You were episode four or five, maybe? Five. <laughs> yes, it sucks. Anyway, over the past 16 months, getting into any new uh, Reddit subs? You know, I'll have to check. I think there are probably a few good ones. Great segment. Good job. Let me see. <laughs> I feel like all of mine over the last, because of the Panera, mm -hmm. are probably like all real soft, fluffy. Great. I've only now come out of my cocoon of comfort media. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I've watched so many reality and dating shows and things that I would normally never watch just because of, of the pediddle. Have you watched Meet the Chimps, which is a chimp reality show that Rachel and Audrey love? I'm putting down my phone and I want you to tell me more. It actually takes place in Louisiana at a okay. chimp sanctuary and it's narrated by Jane Lynch. Wow. That's pretty great. That is pretty great. I'm waiting for sexy beasts. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so when we texted you to come on the show, this was pretty much the first thing that you said that we we're exclusively talking about sexy beasts. That text chain started just when that trailer When the trailer came dropped out. last yeah. week. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait. It's only like a couple more weeks until Sexy Beasts. And I'm okay. like counting it down. I'm like a kid with an advent calendar. <laughs> it's so good. I'm like a little piece of chocolate every day until a fucking Sexy Beast gets here. Here's the question. Will one of them be Ben Kingsley? 
I hope so. It has to be, right? I hope he's the host. Oh, yes. I hope it's Sexy Beast with Ben Kingsley as the oh. host. As the original Sexy Beast, That's I right. know a little something about that. That's the opening. Yep. And he's doing that like Cockney accent. Yeah. Yeah, I'm into it. I want to see that show so badly. Yeah. I've been watching Too Hot to Handle season two. What is that? Oh, Too Hot to Handle is great. <laughs> okay, are you ready? So you know about the circle, right? The, the circle. fuck's the That's circle? Okay. Oh, baby. Layton, fucking buckle up. Because this is the segment. Let's talk about some good Netflix dating shows because right. Netflix has taken over the fucking dating show. All right, well, we do need you to sing the theme song for this yeah. segment. Yeah. Netflix, Netflix taking over, taking over dating shows. Mm. Great, perfect. So number one, when you start off watching Netflix dating shows, you want to start with The Circle. The Circle is a group of six people are invited to live in these apartments, in this apartment complex, which I believe is in Manchester. It's somewhere in England. And it's a real building. I checked because I was like, are these people just on a set somewhere? Mm -hmm. No, they live in this apartment building. And the deal is they never leave their apartment. They never see each other. They talk entirely through a group chat. And you can present yourself as whoever you want. And it's a popularity contest. And every week, somebody is the influencer and somebody is blocked. These are, they get to choose who to block? Yeah, so you rate the other people from like one to six. I see. And whoever's top rated becomes the influencer. Or sometimes like if there are a lot of contestants, two people become the influencers. Mm. And then they discuss together who to block. Oh. And the last one standing wins a bazillion dollars. Mm -hmm. Why is it called the circle? Because I guess it's just you're in a circle of people. I don't know. Or it's a circle of friends or something like that. Social circle, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But it's great because some people, they just go in as themselves. And some people go in and it's like, there was a guy on the second season whose name is Lee. And he's like this 60 something year old writer from Austin who's been with his husband for like 40 years. This is his real. That's who he is for real. And then as part of the contest, he says that he's River, an 18 year old musician. Like a cool guy. He looks kind of the way I picture like Danny looked at 18 if Danny uh -huh. had his now hair. Okay, got it. You know what I mean? Just like laid back musician-y like hippie guy. Uh -huh. And he presents himself that way. And he puts a picture up of this? You put up profile photos. And it can be whatever you want. And it can be whatever you want. And your name can be whatever you want. One woman came on as her husband. Oh. And was like flirting with the women and like becoming popular as her husband. Like there's a lot of the cool stuff like that going on. It is wonderful. It's a great show. It's trash and it's wonderful and I love it. And it's all like Netflix tries to edit it like, wow, we're all really learning something about who we really are and yeah. like what's really true about our friends and how much we really know and what social media is doing, whatever. It's trash and I love it. The second one is called Too Hot to Handle. Too Hot to Handle is even better. Too Hot to Handle is they find the worst, trashiest reality show contestant types they can find and tell them they're basically going to fuck island. Omarosa level. No, no, no. I'm talking like MTV, like a fuck house. Okay. Like, hey, welcome to fuck house. It's time to fuck. <laughs> uh -huh. Like those kinds of people. It's all like really insanely attractive people in their 20s who are just bimbos and himbos that just want to get laid and get drunk all the time. They haven't come out to the island. And for the first day, they're getting them drunk. They're letting them do whatever they want. It's all like really sexy, flirty. Everybody's like on this like really cool Caribbean island making out. And it's just like, hey, what's up? I'm going to get laid. We're all getting laid. Yeah. And then COVID hits. They flip a switch and they go, the first season came out right after COVID. Oh, this is why what? it's cool. They flip a switch and they go, welcome to Too Hot to Handle. There's a $100,000 prize. You are not allowed to touch one another. You are not allowed to kiss one another. You are not allowed any sexual contact of any time, of any kind. You have to make real relationships with each other. We have hidden cameras everywhere. Anytime there is any sexual, physical contact of any kind, we will be removing money from your prize. <laughs> oh, fuck. It's very good. And the first season of this came out like three weeks into lockdown. Uh huh. And so like, we're all watching these hot people that can't touch each other. And we're like, I get this. Yes. I get this. I feel where you are right now. I understand your frustration. And then season two just came out while everything's opening up again. And now we get to be like, 
you're gross. <laughs> <laughs> you're gross. Have some self-respect. <laughs> so wait, how often do people end up breaking it? So often. I think the prize in the first season, I'm still watching season two, but I think the prize in the first season goes down to something like $40,000. Everyone individually has a pot of 100 grand? No, it's a group pot of 100 grand. Oh, and they're going to divide it all. Yeah. Oh. And so it's like, you're already starting off with like, the prize is like 10K each, yeah, right? Yeah. But then you leave and it's like these kids have been making minimum wage, which yeah. is fine because you're still living on an island for free and they're still getting whatever appearance fee well, they and get. And you know what? At some point you're like, look, I could probably use the money, but maybe it's worth it to fuck the hottest person I've ever fucked. So at some it's point that price gets, it gets <laughs> low enough that it's actually a good deal yeah. to just start having sex with everybody. Once the prize goes down, right? you have to do the math because once the prize goes down to $50,000, you're talking about $5,000 per person, right? Yeah. You're on this island for what? three weeks, four weeks to shoot this show, a month all-inclusive on an island, $5,000, that's a pretty good rate for that vacation, actually. Yes, that's you might as well right. fuck on Fuck Island. That's right. Anything under 50 grand. Because you got to take taxes out of that, Yeah. Too, right? Very true, yeah. Because that's, yeah, because that's- Sex taxes. That's a 1099. You're not an employee. <laughs> he's right. When he's right, 100%. he's right. If you get $5,000 on Fuck Island, that's only 2,500 bucks. No, you might no. as well take it down to zero. That's right. At some point, it's just not going to be worth it. Just have a great time. So you can't get voted off at all. Some people are so toxic that they are asked to leave. The show does not have a real host. It has like a digital assistant named Lana, who's like Alexa, but for not fucking. <laughs> She's like Alexa for celibacy. Is that because it's anal backwards? Whoa. Whoa. I actually never Swish. noticed. Swish. <laughs> Nothing but oh, not. Damn. Are the producers of Too Hot to Handle more clever than me? I'm having a crisis now. Does wow. Lana just go like, are you fucking? And they're all like, yep, damn it. Oh, <laughs> I should have said We're no. We're supposed to say no. Right, right. I like the idea of it being honor system, but they're so stupid they don't realize right. it is. Yeah. Are we fucking only a little? Oh, come on. <laughs> I said only a little. <laughs> So it's like this digital assistant and there's one in every room, like in every set. No. So she can like pop to anywhere. But of course they have like cameras everywhere and stuff too. And she'll send people on one-on-ones, bachelor style. And she'll mm. be like, remember, you're not allowed to kiss or touch or hug or anything, but we're sending you on this date. Get to know each other. No touching. It's like if you work on this show, you just get to watch video of a lot of hot people having sex. If you're like editing it. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, it's a win-win-win. Yeah, I think. that's right. I feel like with the digital assistant, you could either have her constantly playing like really sexy music because you mm -hmm. can get some really fun needle drops in there yeah. or the least sexual music possible. Yeah, like the most unwanted song. Do you know about this? No. What? The go-to one for like torture tactics? No, you don't know. What is the most unwanted song? Is it a Billy Joel song? No, to me personally it is. But so <laughs> this is like probably 25 years ago or relate. something. I can't I'm too Jewish. I'm genetically predisposed to like Billy Joel. I can't help it. We all have our faults. Komar and Melamid were the names, I think, of the scientists. Uh -huh. And they basically put out a survey to people. And they said, what are your favorite things in music and your least favorite things in music? And they okay. released this massive survey. And then they hired songwriters to write songs based on the things people like the most, which they called the most wanted song and the most unwanted song. Now, the most wanted song is like a shitty love duet. Yeah. <gasps> people said their favorite thing in music was a duet. It's got like a sax solo. What year was this study done? This is like late 90s, I think. Okay, okay, okay. okay but okay, okay, okay. the most unwanted song, they took all the stuff that people hate the most and those include opera, rap, tubas, very long songs, oh, you can, children's, you holiday songs. You could tell this song. was done in like the mid-90s when people are like, the thing we want the least is rap. I got to yeah. find this. I hate those rappers yeah. with their hippie hoppies. Yeah, and it's like there are no connotations to this broad statement about a genre of yeah. music. <laughs> no, not at all. We don't need to unpack this. Listen to this. The most unwanted music. So this is all the stuff people claim to hate the most. Oh, I'm already in. in. It, the thing is, it rules. So people also no, hate- No, this is dope! Okay, no, no, but what people also claim they hated is massive tempo and stylistic shifts. Oh, so the interesting so, shit? Yeah. It's, it's, did Melamed invent lo-fi? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think they, I think they invented lo-fi. If you put okay. a beat behind this, get ready. Remember, they also hate children's choirs and holiday songs. Anybody who hates children's choirs and music is an asshole. I'm gonna let this play out. The song is uh, 22 minutes long. Oh my god! So we're gosh. not gonna listen to the whole thing. No, yes. skip to a thing. It's gonna get there soon. Ooh. This is like some Peter and the Wolf shit. I can get down. This is one of my favorite things. This is Western shit. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Give me an orchestra hit. That does a tuba. Uh, this get, is the menu music to every PS1 ready. song. Here we go. Opera singer rapping. Wait, did did they just make a Weird Al album on accident? <laughs> kind of. Oh, <laughs> this slaps. There's some bad this pipes in here. Absolutely slaps. It totally does. Wait till the kids come in. Come on. What's next, baby? I think this What's is next? Is this it? No. It's good. It's definitely good. All no, right. it's good. Sorry. I want to get to the holiday song. That's my ringtone now. Let's see if this is it. <laughs> this might be the best part. Are you sure this isn't just a Beatles album? <laughs> it, it's like the B-sides. Yeah, are you sure this isn't just Yellow Submarine or some shit? Oh, here we go. Here we go. This is it yeah, definitely this is has just a Sergeant revolution. Pepper. Hey, listen, though. Number nine? Yes. <laughs> Number Pitch. nine? Wait, wait. You wait, wait. wait. You wait for it. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's Christmas time. Hell yeah, it is. Yo, can we talk about getting, can we talk about getting grant money and coming out the other side with that song? Okay, now, Please, now. please tell me camera picked up you mouthing along with the fucking oh, lyrics. Oh, it's the best. I don't know if it did, I think of the phone. Oh, but here, let me play the most wanted song for you, <laughs> which sucks. Although, actually, I think now that I'm really into smooth jazz, I might like this more. This is the most wanted the song. most wanted music. Actually, this probably rules. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it actually rules. Depends on where it goes from here. You gotta listen to the lyrics, though. Because they're really meaningful. This is exactly the album I'm writing now. Lying in my silken sheets. Yeah. I like the other one better. Uh, it's Anyway. Yeah, the other one kind of slaps, but I want to talk about these researchers yeah. getting grant money and then using a large portion of that grant money to record essentially a studio album. They hired musicians and singers, like that woman that was just singing on that duet. All pros. Those were pro session musicians. Yeah, that's good tone on that sax there. Fuck. All right, we got to move on to segments. Time for segments. Now- our first segment, this is a real treat to get to do this in person, Anthony, because our first segment is our pop culture recommendation segment, mm. which is called What's Popping? So the real thing that's great about this segment is the theme song, because, sorry, Layden, are you distracted by something? I'm enjoying a delicious, refreshing Gatorade. What flavor is that? It's a glacier cherry. Mm. Why not just call it cherry? Regular cherries aren't from glaciers. Okay, you know what? Fair enough. Okay, because I stand. It's, it's Gatorade Frost, so it's not the regular kind of Gatorade, so it's less good. I stand corrected. It is white. Okay, so why did Wild Cherry become like white? It's all white. Are now. you talking about the band that plays play that funky music? Is that the name <laughs> of that band? It is. Wild Cherry. There's a Reddit post that's like, 
Does anybody else really like that song that goes like, play that fucking white music? <laughs> play that fucking music, play white boy. Play that fucking music. <laughs> it's a great song. I'm so glad I flubbed that. Anyway, yeah. So the thing that's really amazing about what's popping is not that we get to recommend our favorite pop culture thing. Do you listen to the show ever? No, I try okay, not great. to. Thank God. So I'm assuming you probably haven't heard the theme song for this I feel like show. we did this last time I was here. Did what? This exact conversation. Wh- which was what? The theme song for What's Poppin'. And what do you remember about it? Just this and a feeling of dread. Dread about what? I don't know. What do you think is the worst outcome that might happen right now? Death. You're not wrong. <laughs> Ask an answer. In terms of the theme song. I'm considering For What's Popping. Oh, I guess there isn't one. I just feel dread and I don't know why. I don't think there's any reason to feel dread. Oh, great. Hold on. I'm Tell that to my central nervous system right now. Text. Well, there's no reason to feel dread because the theme song is astonishing. Is nothing short of astonishing. Now, you're not going to hear it unless you put on those cans. Fucking hell. Leighton's heard this so many times. This thing happened with Leighton. It's really interesting. Someone should write a paper about it because it's kind of a psychological effect where, you know, when you really love something and you kind of listen to it a lot, you're going to want both ears on there. I'm going to put it on in a second. No, no, but put them both on. <laughs> when are you going to play uh, the song? I, well, as soon as I'm done with this thing. Okay, I think do the thing and then I'll put the other ear on. I'm not doing a thing. I'm playing a song. Right. Leighton heard it so much. She loved it. She kind of got too used to it. So you I feel think she's very trying confrontational to, right now. I don't know why. I'm not being aggressive in any way towards you, Brian. I'm not being aggressive at all. Other than the death threat that I just made. This feels really weird. So she's trying to give herself some distance. How many times can I reassure you? If it's Christmas every day. Exactly. So she's right. trying to give herself a short break from listening to the, the what's popping. Christmas every day. You eventually song. murder your family and make the <laughs> Christmas tree. <laughs> all right, I'm ready. Okay, so I do need both ears on. So clearly, last time you were on, I think we had the theme song for this. It's been revised, expanded, generally reworked. Director's cut. You know, I have a new uh, synthesizer over here. I got some good good patches from that thing. And I kind of really put some effort into it. Okay, so uh, here we go. Wait. You can really hear the Gatorade through the cans. Yeah. (laughs) Just one <laughs> Let me just... Yeah, right. that's good. Please, I'm Is that trying a warbler? To... Are you <laughs> doing a warbler? Is that a swallow? I'm trying to play the theme song. Can it? <laughs> All right, here we go. Should I be hearing it? No, I'm just about to start it. Should I? feels like something you should have queued up. I am. So it just takes Previ- a second. It takes like a second to load. It feels like it's this is something the, the, the that you DIY have, like, thing here. Like we took a break. We took a break. And you I was, could have queued it up. I was peeing. It just feels like, I'm just, I don't know. Look, you're welcome to engineer the show. It feels know. weird that we would start up the show. All right, starting right now. Okay. Three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Yeah. Yep. One. Play. Should I be hearing the song? No. We put it in in post. Why do I have my cans on? What? (laughs) I think that worked great. All right. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? What is the bit? Is this the bit? Excellent question, <laughs> Anthony. Great Are we doing the fucking bit? question. Brian, we don't want to spend three hours recording this episode. Fuck, I considered walking over there, grabbing one of those juggling bits and just... <sighs> I tried something a little different this week. Oh, did you? Yeah. He does this every week. I love that. Thank you. Normally, I don't make our guests put on their headphones. This is why the feeling of dread. His vagus nerve knew. That's right. Anyway, what the fuck? It's what's popping. We didn't even. What's we, poppin'? we never introduced our guest. Let's introduce the show and our guest. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Late Night with Brian Wecht. That other voice was Brian Wecht. Hi, this is Layton. Hi, mystery guest. Would you care to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Anthony Carboni. Fabulous. All right, Great. Anthony, what's popping? Oh man. You ever gone and seen a movie of 4DX? (laughs) What the fuck is 4DX? Uh, I'm so glad you asked, Leighton. 4DX (laughs) is when you go into a theater and you sit on that chair 
It's a motion chair. <gasps> Does it have the bumpies? It has the bumpies. Not only is it a motion chair, it is a smoke chair. It is a water droplet chair. What? It yes. is, there are lighting effects in oh, the theater. Jesus. I went and I saw Fast 9, the greatest film ever made by a certain rubric. And <laughs> it was like riding a goddamn ride. It was the best. Your feet aren't on the ground. They're in like cool 40X stirrups. Yeah. Like when they're driving, the whole thing is like bumping. Really? Them. Yeah. And not just that, but like during the fight scenes when people are hitting each other. Some guy comes in and just starts punching. <laughs> yeah, he just wails on you. Yeah. He just wails on you. But they give you a safe word before you go in. That's and great. so it's cool. It's very cool. But no, like if somebody gets kicked in the shoulder, there are little things that thump you in the shoulder. What? Yeah, and like in the lower back, and like you can feel like a punch. It's not hard, it's like a slow sort of thing, but it's there. And then there are strobe lights all around the theater. There's smoke, there's wind effects. So when they start driving faster, wind starts like flying in your face. See, I can understand a lot of it, but not the, when a guy gets punched on screen, you feel it. See, that's the only part I can fuck with. The rest of this sounds like motion sickness hell. You have an individual controller on your chair and you can turn down the amount of motion. You can also turn off the water effects. Oh, wow. So if you have a snack and you don't want to get splashed while you're eating a snack, you can just turn How off the water. How much water is there? Not much. It's like a sprinkling. It's okay. only like two it's like gallons. A mist. It's a fine mist. It's less than like when you go to one of those like theme park movies yes, where they splash yes, yes. you. It's yeah. way less than that. Honey, okay. I shrunk the audience yeah. bullshit. Yeah, a Shrek 4D. Uh-huh. Oh, Shrek 4D. Shrek 4D is great, but it doesn't have the X. By the way, I hate the fact that there's 4D. I know what the fourth dimension is. I've met the fucking fourth dimension. Yeah. It's not a motion chair. We're, okay, PhD. We're living in the fourth dimension all the time. Hell yeah. It's all around us. I mean, any movie is technically fourth dimensional because it has a runtime. Thank you. That's correct. Actually, movies are two-dimensional because they're on a screen. Yeah. So really? there's only three dimensions anyway. Well, I guess if it's a 3D movie, it's automatically 4D. That's right, but it'd have to be 3D. For, movies are normally 2D. Yeah, it would have to be a 3D movie, but because of its runtime, because the fourth dimension is time, it could be a four-dimensional. Every piece of media that we think of as 2D is actually 3D. That's right. I love this. Turn um, up the 3D, 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 3. 3D, 3D, 3? <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I've only seen two movies in 4DX. The first one I saw was a few years back. I went and I saw Valyrian and the City of a Thousand oh, Planets. Yes. Okay, oh. yes. Perfectly fine movie. Great ride. They go to space, right? Yes, they do. So do they suck all the oxygen out of the theater? Yeah. Great. Oh, sick. Uh, actually, John Cena's performance does that. <laughs> oh! Hey! I like that. Pew, 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 pew. He started talking about Taiwan, and then everyone was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part, other than the 4DX of it, which I'm really saying to go see a movie in 4DX if you have one in your city. I'm not saying necessarily go see Fast 9. You already know if you're going to like Fast 9. But my favorite part of it is that Dominic Toretto has a child. And so he must interface with this child in a fatherly, loving way. Uh -huh. And there is a scene where he literally looks at his kid and he's like... <laughs> And that's his face of love. His son's name is Brian. Yeah, of course. After Paul Walker's character. And he goes, Will you play to Brian? Will be. <laughs> <laughs> I think at one point, Vin Diesel was a decent actor. Some of the Riddick stuff is yeah. pretty solid too. Yeah. And you think about like the first time we saw him was in Saving Private Ryan. And we're like, holy shit, that kid can act. Triple X. Triple X. Solid. Solid acting. The pacifier. The pacifier. <laughs> and I think like over time, as he got more into this, like I've got to be more hetero every movie. Like that became the thing. And now he lost any other acting range because he's trying so hard to be so a man at all times. Can't fully put his arms down because yeah. of the fat, manly, heterosexual biceps. And what's funny is like Cena's walking around and I'm like a normal guy. Yeah. Like Cena's just like, I can't wait to collect this paycheck and have this launch me into the next phase of my career. Thank you for having me on the Fast 9. Yeah. What a great time. Um, meanwhile, Vin Diesel's just like, there's a part where he has to show like a mix of frustration and sadness and all this stuff because his brother is turning on him. And the only thing he can think to do is flex his fist more, <laughs> like a tighter fist. But I love everything about the film. Magnets play a very large part in this movie. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's the best magnet-based movie I've ever love seen in my life. Stuff, magnets, yeah. bitch. The whole thing is based around what if car chase with magnets. That's the whole movie. Okay, I like that. It's so good. And in 4DX, it's phenomenal. Because as things are getting magnetized and pushed away from each other, your seat's going like this. Oh, 
I am so intrigued by this notion of 40X because I really want it for like an early 2000s rom-com. I want 13 going on 30. Like failure to launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Notting Hill 40X is the best (laughs) way to watch Notting Hill. Yes. My best friend's wedding 40X. Holy shit. That's that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. I did look after seeing Fast 9 because I had so much fucking fun watching this 40 movie. I looked up the 40X site and you can buy... 40X seats for your home. What? How much are they? They're not cheap. 10 grand? Yeah, it's like 10, 15 okay. grand for like two seats. And Ooh. then you have to buy 40X encoded movies. Right. Well, and then also you got to buy the liquid. I'm sure it's just I water. I would be able to manufacture my own. Yeah, well, it says the man who keeps cans of piss in his garage. That one time, maybe <laughs> more. You say it once on the podcast, and I will haunt you with that no, for fucking ever. Fair Please. enough. Please explain to me the piss jug. I accidentally drank my own piss because (laughs) I I was drinking a bottle of green tea and I drank the bottle of green tea. Sure. And then I peed into the bottle of green tea and then I forgot about it and I thought it was a full bottle of green tea and I put it back in the fridge. And the next day I took it out and took a big old swig of it. And at first I was like, this green tea tastes bad. And then I was like, oh my God, I just drank my own piss. I essentially barfed it into the sink while my wife lost her mind because she thought it was the funniest thing that ever fucking happened. Well, number one, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Number two... You had access to a refrigerator, but not a toilet? Well, I forgot, because I will sometimes bring out a bottle of green tea here and then forget to drink it and then bring it back inside. No, 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 that's not what I'm asking. You're avoiding the question. Okay. (laughs) I've seen how far it is to your restroom. Yes. Why did you pee in the bottle of green tea instead of going to the bathroom? The fridge is right there. So when I brought the green tea in, I put it back in the fridge. Once again, I'm I'm really not. Walk me through it. Okay, you bring the green tea out here. Correct. You drink the green tea. Whole thing. Great. Yep. You have to go to the bathroom. Yes. You don't go to your house to do that. That's right, because the fridge is right there. Right. But the bathroom's closer than the fridge. (laughs) Yeah, but I had peed into the bottle. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) What's the disconnect? I mean, look, here's the thing. This is a funny loop, and I'll do it three more times, but I genuinely do want to know. Anthony, have you ever been in a vibe? Were you vibing? I was, and I was in a a mode where I didn't want to leave the vibe zone, the chill zone in the garage, because I knew if I walked outside into the light, the vibe would crash. Right. Well, if it was to stay vibing and thriving, I understand. Yes. Now, the error I made was bringing it back inside and putting it in the fridge and then drinking it the next day. Now, here's the question you're going to ask. How did it taste? And the answer is, not too shabby. (laughs) Been eating clean? Yeah. 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 There you go. I stay healthy. A healthy 46-year-old man. I'm doing that thing where I'm drinking a gallon of water every day. I guess this can count as what's popping. Sure. (laughs) Your fucking bladder? (laughs) My bladder is about to fucking pop. (laughs) I just started doing it, and I'm just peeing every 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been doing it for almost a week now, and everybody's like, your body gets used to it. And I'm like, no, I'm just peeing and burping. At some point, you reach a... Saturation point? Yes, your bladder can only get so big, right? Right. I feel like it's there now. Yeah. If it's been a week... How much bigger is it going to get? And like, how much moisture am I missing at this point? Yeah. It's going to start seeping out of your pores. How hydrated am I not at this point? I think you're fully hydrated. You look hydrated. Layton, what's popping? What's popping for me, as I mentioned on the mini-sode this week, is I finally watched Better Call Saul season five after a whole four-season rewatch. And then additionally, I watched every interview with Jonathan Banks I could find on YouTube. What a fucking delight. Just absolute delight. Season five, fucking amazing. It's like the best show on TV right now. And then Jonathan Banks. What a wonderful, interesting man is Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Mike Ehrmantraut, right? That's correct. Yeah. He's been he's been around forever. Uh, Forever. Did you know he's the mental hospital attendant in Buckaroo Banzai? Yes. Yeah. Did you know he is one of the police officers in Gremlins? I did not know that. Yeah. He's an airplane? Yeah. Who was he in an airplane? I don't know, but he was in it. Wow. Yeah, but yeah. there's a really great interview with him and Mark Margoli. Margolis. Mar- oh, or Margolis. Margolis. Margolis, Mar- Margolis, I don't know. He's Hector Salamanca in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, and he's just an old Jewish man and not a scary cartel man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just talk about their long careers acting like very gently and like just two sweet, yeah. sweet, intelligent old men reminiscing. I fell out of Better Call Saul, not because I wasn't enjoying it, but I think after season two, I fell out and I just never got back into it. And I don't know why. It's worth it. 
I think it's just because when a show's at a certain level of intensity, if I fall off of it, I got to like rev myself back up. Especially because it's so slow that like it's the momentum of it that gets you through it, especially when you get into season five when shit starts really popping off. I mean, even like end of season three, shit pops off yeah. and then continues to. I feel like Breaking Bad was like that for me where I tried to watch the first season like a few times and the first season was just too intense and too real. I know a lot of people have had that experience with Breaking Bad where it's hard to get through the first season. Once you get through it, it becomes more of like a, the pacing is there. This is a TV show. This is like heightened intensity. I think the first season just has too much realism of the situation of his life. I was scared to watch it forever because I was like, I've lost too many people to cancer. I don't want to watch a show about a guy that has cancer. Like, yeah. honestly, that was my whole thing. Like, I hear it's great. Not interested in watching a show about a cancer guy. And then you get past the first season and they kind of allude to it occasionally. And that's well, pretty and much it. Great because it's like, I want this guy to bite it. Right. Yeah. But then, yeah, once I got past that first season, then I binge watched it up to, I think, like the last few episodes. And then I watched it in real time with everybody. But Better Call Saul, I haven't jumped back in. And I feel you like should. I should. I know I should. Sure. But I genuinely felt so bad for Jimmy and his brother yeah. in the oh, first season. It gets worse. And then in second season, you're just like, hey, fuck Jimmy's brother. Chuck is like maybe one of the most hateable characters totally. in anything, but also he's right. Michael McKean is amazing as that character. He's such an asshole and he's completely right. And it's the best. <sighs> yeah, I'll get back in. Yeah, season five introduces a villain who is like, He's great. And also, like, as it converges with the Breaking Bad timeline, I was really like, oh, I don't want them to do this. But the way they integrate it is, like, really smart and interesting and, like, yeah. fun. See, they got to do it eventually. Those guys are aging. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I worry already, for Jonathan Banks. It's already a point where it's a little ridiculous. <sighs> yeah, everyone's significantly older in these decade-ago flashbacks. Anyway, that's what's popping for me. Brian, what's popping for you? What's popping for me this week is we lost one of the greats this past week, the pianist and composer Frederick Rzhevsky, who's an American uh, composer. He was one of the most political contemporary classical composers around. He wrote a lot, but his like most famous work is called The People United Shall Never Be Defeated, which is based on a protest song from Chile, like a protest against Allende in the 70s. It's a theme in variations. And this guy was just like a Beast. I mean, a monster pianist, very, very politically engaged. His stuff is very accessible in a way that a lot of contemporary classical isn't. I saw a couple of years ago, uh, he wrote a new thing called Songs of Insurrection, not after January 6th, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, but right. like kind of based on protest songs from around the world. And it was just a stunning performance here in LA at this thing called Piano Spheres, which does contemporary piano music. He was 83. I think he was in pretty good health, died of a heart attack. But I heard one of his pieces when I was in college and I was like, this just rules. Like the people united shall never be defeated has like banging on the lit, like a lot of extended piano techniques. Yeah. And it's just very accessible and interesting and fun. And he was a just a giant of contemporary classical. He died this week. Rip. Yeah. All my brain was telling me to do was to pull out my phone and go, well, let's listen to some of it and then play that song we listened to before. <laughs> you know what? It was telling me to pull it out I and get play it. I the get most it. hated music. Because Brian did this the last time <laughs> yes, that we recorded. That's exactly something I would do. He, he had a runner with Logan Paul? No, Jake Paul. Jake Paul's It's Every Day, bro. Jake Paul and Team 10. You cannot underestimate the contribution of Team 10. Anyway, he did that where he kept repeatedly playing that song. It included, I went to the bathroom and I came back to him still playing the song into the... I mean, we can say this. It really is every day, bro. It is. It's true. And it's so exhausting. It's and it is every it's day, 4D, bro. It's 4D. Every... If you think about it, every day happens every day. Shit. Did Frederick Ruszewski say that? Yeah, I believe he did. <laughs> I think he, he wrote the beat for It's Every Day, bro. So if people were going to get into this composer, the people united shall never be defeated. That's the one to That's do. the one. The theme is a, just a song. I mean, it sounds like a, a normal song. And then wow. the variations goes all over the place. 36 variations. It's like an hour or so total. So it's, it's like a trek, but it's really, really worth it. Well, you heard it here first, folks. It sounds like a song. Time for our final segment. <laughs> Great. Peaches and lemons. Let's move through these quick so hey, we can some to mercy. That. I what? say it. Oh, you sorry. you okay. fucked up your whole introduction for what's popping. I did exactly what I intended with that, which was to bring comedy and light into the world. Anyway, here's our final segment. It's called Peaches and Lemons, and the theme song goes here. Peaches and lemons. 
great that was the theme song. This is three-part gratitude exercise, one part petty grievance airing. I did a great job. You did great. Episode 71? Shit. Yes. And I still stumble still. through that. <laughs> I can't muster any sort of energy to do the introduction for this segment because I loathe myself as a podcaster. So anyway, we're all going to do 11. And here we are, 76 episodes in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this motherfucker won't turn off his notifications. Well, what if something important happens? That's right. What if I get a text from Brent? <laughs> <laughs> In comedy, that's called juxtaposition. Do you guys get the thing on your phone where you get a scam call and it says scam likely? Yeah. Yeah. Every time, every time, <laughs> every time Rachel sees scam likely, I'm like, well, that's my manager, scam likely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really does sound like an old Hanna-Barbera villain. Right? Yeah. yeah. What are we going to do? Boo-boo. <laughs> scam likely is coming. <laughs> oh, please. Mr. Likely is my father. Call me scam. Yeah. I've long, longed to say to someone, please, Mr. Wecht was my father. You can call me Dr. Wecht. <laughs> I can't believe that's never come up. I know, right? I'm going to drop my lemon first. Do it, do it, do it. Did you guys know that there's a chlorine shortage right now? Why? No. For various reasons, partially pandemic, partially that one of the chlorine plants like burned down or broke or something. Isn't that toxic? Chlorine gas is toxic. Yeah. Yes. Wouldn't that be toxic if the plant burnt down? I think it depends on what how it happened, right. but something, you know. That sounds bad. I think everyone was okay. But if you have a chlorinated pool, you know, we do not have a pool, you're kind of fucked. But you know who does have a chlorinated pool is Audrey's summer camp. <gasps> so no. they are looking into how to fix the pool, but one of the big attractions of the camp was swim, swim, swim. And look, it's far from a tragedy. This Sight. is why this is a lemon. But for the last week or so until they work it out, she hasn't been able to swim at uh. her camp. They've been great. They put up water slides. It's far from a disaster. Yeah. But she was bummed because she can't go swim at this uh. camp. But that yeah, sucks. there's a big chlorine shortage on right now. I had no idea. Yeah. All these fucking crazy supply problems going on with various things. Yeah. And cars. Because of semiconductors and stuff. Lumber. Graphics cards. Uh, yeah. Add uh, chlorine to that list. You know, you can't talk to me in the morning until I've had my graphics card. <laughs> <laughs> I go through like 15, 20 graphics cards a week. Just buy yeah. them and smash them up. Yeah. Now I just can't have them. I just, I feel a little run down and irritable <laughs> if I don't have like three graphics yeah. cards a day. Yeah, you got to move into snorting it and you just do a little yeah. crushing and it's a better. Anyway, Anthony, what's your lemon? My lemon this week is the weird sort of liminal etiquette space we're in right now regarding whether I am or am not an asshole, depending on whether I am or am not wearing a mask in one or another particular oh, yeah. building. Oh, yeah. Mm. My gut tells me to just keep wearing it. And the latest public proclamation tells me my gut was right. Because we're supposed to start wearing them again indoors mm. in public spaces. Yep, WHO just said mm -hmm. that, right? But it's one of those things where like the first day the mask thing was lifted, I was like, well, surely we're going to be a little respectful. And I walked into the coffee shop by my place and nobody was wearing a mask, including employees. And everybody literally, I swear it was like a sitcom style record scratch where everybody looked at me like I was insane for having the mask on when it was yep. no mask day. And then I go into my apartment building and I walked back in from the coffee shop into my lobby and immediately two people get out of the elevator with masks on and they look at me again like I'm an asshole because I took my mask off because nobody at the coffee shop was wearing them. Yep. I'm easily socially pressured. Yeah. I'm a weak-willed boy and I just want to know which way I'm supposed to behave right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird time with that. My personal rule is I'm wearing it indoors still. Mm -hmm. End of story. Yeah. Like, we are not eating indoors mm -hmm. yep i won't do it with audrey because obviously she's not vaccinated but yeah even before the who today said hey delta 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 everyone keep your masks mm -hmm. on inside uh i'm still wearing my mask inside until like we're kind of yeah. out of the woods the other thing is it takes weeks for symptoms to show up the fact that it's like okay you don't need your mask and everyone's like yay party times like no yeah. guys like fucking no <laughs> wait <laughs> just wait another month and see what happens yeah, yeah. I was kind of hoping, as somebody who has to travel a lot or had to travel a lot for work before all this went down, yeah. I'm constantly in airports. I was hoping two things were going to happen. I was hoping, number one, maybe we would adopt the mask thing. You only adopted the mask. <laughs> maybe we would adopt the mask thing because like when I would travel to like Asia and some parts of like Europe, people would just wear them anyway. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. It's and considerate. And I thought maybe we would all think to ourselves, hey, I've been wearing a mask for a year and a half and I haven't gotten a single cold. 
I've been washing my hands and wearing a mask, mm -hmm. and I haven't been sick once. And I thought maybe we would adopt that, and then everything turned very political, and now it's like we're never going to adopt yeah. that. Yeah. And the second thing that I hoped would happen is men would just wash their hands regularly. Why? Why would you? So in the movie theater bathroom yesterday, I go back in. I remember a tweet that I saw. I think it was uh, Demi Adejuwebe. Yeah, he rules. He's awesome. And he tweeted, like, when this all started going down, he was like, I know that this is serious because every man in the airport restroom is washing his hands right now. I can't get to a sink in the airport restroom. Yeah. Like, if you travel a lot, you know, dudes just don't wash their hands in restrooms. They take dumps and walk right out. They just right walk out. right out. What? Sometimes they'll do the, like, ceremonial, like, real quick yeah. under and be like, yeah. Done. Which to me always seemed like more of a signal to other people. Yeah. Rather than a. Oh, no, no. That's, yeah. that's me thing. telling you I'm clean. That's right. Yeah. But you're not, dude, because I know you didn't really wash your yep. hands. Yep. I was in the movie theater restroom yesterday. Dudes weren't washing their hands. It's already gone. Sick. Because the government is trying to see if you're compliant. That's why they want you to wash so your dumb. hands. 5G. I've been so tempted to tweet from NSP washing your hands after using the bathroom. It's a sucker's game. <laughs> Don't do it. And I'm not going to. It's the wrong time. That's when you flip it to washing your hands is sexy. Anyway, my lemon is I live in a studio apartment and flies get in there. And when a fly is in your studio apartment, it is very annoying because it's like there is no escape. Anyway, get home from a walk after my shit week of getting hacked and a billion little stupid things happening. And I'm like, finally, I can eat my leftover Taco Bell and relax. But first, I'm going to kill this fly. Fly lands on my bedroom window that's like right above my bed. And I go to smack him, and I smack him, and my hand goes directly through my window. No! <laughs> and shatters my entire window. No! And I stand there for a moment with my hand through my window. You Bruce Lee palm striked your window? Can I ask you a question, though? Yeah. Did you feel pain? No. Fuck yeah. Get it? Well, like window pain? Mm, I'm going to kill you. Because you touched it with uh, your hand. This is all I got. They get it. I fully expected to pull my hand back out and like have horror movie like shards of glass sticking out. And I think the thing is, the window is so shitty that it only got me a little bit, but enough to the point that I was like drip bleeding and I was like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Anyway, I covered it in tin foil and duct tape. And the great news is now every time there's a mild breeze, which is literally all the time, the tin foil crinkles and you hear it throughout my entire apartment. And the code to this story is that the fly lived and is still in my apartment and I can't catch it. What? Oh my God. So great time for a heat wave. I'm so sorry. Uh, you want to talk about Breaking Bad? That's a great episode of Breaking Yeah, Bad. hell yeah it is. <laughs> this whole thing was directed by Ryan Johnson. <laughs> <sighs> that sucks. That's such a pet yeah. peeve for me too. I think it's the ADHD. I mean, it's for everybody, but I feel like I'm super sensitive to something like where it's like, I can hear that fly from feel across like the- whip. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you hear it hit the window. Yep. Oh, I hate the sound of a bug. Like it's always when I go to sleep or take a nap when they're like, I'm just going to buzz around right above you and yes. what drive you insane. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Peaches, we'll each do three things that are good. I will start because I also have these on my phone. Oh, okay. Number one, Peach. I hadn't used the audio or video setup for a little while. Mm -hmm. I turned everything on. Yeah. Jarek, our producer, helped me set it up. Mm -hmm. I turned everything on and it just worked. Hey. And how often does that ever happen? Never. Love that. Never. The video is working. The audio is working. As I say, five minutes before that thing's about to crash and we lose everything. But yeah, it just worked. It was amazing. Hell yeah. Beautiful. Peach number two. I made some very lovely pork cutlets last night mm. where I breaded them and then kind of pan fried them in a little bit of oil. Mm. Haven't done this in a while. I love a nice fried cutlet. Oh, yeah. And it was very, very good. What could this word mean? Let's see. <laughs> oh, I know what it means. How fun. I, <laughs> we are fully mastered now with the latest NSP album. Hey, congrats. congrats. Yep. And we are moving into the manufacturing stage. Nice. So it's hopefully that'll be out in the fall sometime. Wow. We got Twerp to re-record a wow. bunch of old school NSP songs. And that'll be the next album. So that's it's very so exciting. rad. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Wow. All right, that's it. Anthony Peaches. Peaches, number one, I bought this survival blanket. Mm. I'm not an everyday carry. I'm not an EDC person, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. here's a pen that does 18 things and this notebook is, you can put it under the yep, washing. Yep, yep. Like, I'm not one of those guys. But for some reason, I saw this little portable fold up like nylon survival blanket. Like one of the shiny ones? Like not a, a shiny McGill one, not a chuck. It's more like you could put it up and it would be like a lean-to tarp or something, uh, like, like a nylon, okay. yes. like almost yes, a yes, windbreaker yes. material. But it folds up into this tiny little pouch and 
I was like, I don't know why I bought this. I just felt like I needed to buy it. I've been walking like a couple blocks to the park by my house and laying out my blanket every day and bringing oh, the dog okay. and just sitting in the sun on this little blanket. Nice. And I'm like, this is so lovely. Just bringing a book and hanging and letting the dog run around in the park. Fuck yeah. And I got my nice little blanket and it has like little weighted stakes that are built into it so you can oh, push it down so it doesn't blow away. Crucial. It's so good. So that's number one. Number two is I have been streaming every single Zelda game in release order. Yeah, I've seen you wow. tweet about this, yes. On my Twitch channel, and it's been a lot of fun because a lot of people have been coming in and just like, we've all been re-watching and like re-experiencing these games together. Mm -hmm. And it's my favorite series, and I've replayed a lot of them throughout the years in, in bits and pieces, but it's been wild to go through them in order yeah. and like talk with everybody about like not just the history of it and the making of it, but like everybody's personal history with like this yeah. shared yeah. thing. And everybody's got a different favorite and everybody's got a different story about when they played it and how they played it. And it's been really fun to just do that with people. Is anyone's favorite too? No, right. <laughs> we call two in my community the very rude game. Yeah, it is a very it rude game. It is awful. Awful. They were still learning about game, and they went in the wrong direction. Well, it's amazing, even with that first one, mm -hmm. how little handholding there is. When it's just like, good luck. Somebody had to remind me. They're like, it came with a map. It came yes. with a paper map. Yes. When you don't see that, you're like, where the fuck am I? Yeah. It came with a paper map that you had to look at, and you were supposed to mark where you found yep. things. Yep. And that's how you found out how to play Ooh, a Zelda. It boy. was not good, but it's good? I don't know. So that's two. And then number three is I most recently got into Trejo's Donuts. Are Ooh. they good? I've always They're wanted to go. so fucking good. Okay, What's the best go. one? So Trejo's Donuts, they have a really good one that's like a berry frosting that looks like a cartoon Simpsons donut mm. that is very good. But they also have like a Dulce de Leche like coffee one right, that, that has like a solid. little bit of a cream oh. filling. I like a fancy donut. Mm -hmm. I'm a fancy donut guy and LA is great. Like donuts are everywhere, yeah. but fancy donuts are surprisingly few and far between. What's an example of a non-Trejo fancy donut? Is Blue Star fancy? Blue Star would be a fancy donut. Okay, great. Voodoo is kind of a fancy donut. Like if you can get to Voodoo like early in the morning because they have to make them at such scale at Voodoo because yeah, 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 they're yeah, a tourist yeah. thing. But if you can get like a fresh Voodoo donut, that's like a quality okay. donut. But like if you live in San Francisco, there's a place called Dynamo in the Mission that's like a very good gourmet donut. Mm. But I love that. And so I've been very into Trejo's Donuts. Is there just the one in Hollywood or are there others? There are two. So there's the one in Hollywood and that's the one that I go to. Yeah. And I think there's another one like more towards out West. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe downtown, but oh, Trejo's Donuts. Have you ever been to the Brandy's with the big donut yeah. by the airport? Is that place good? It's okay. <laughs> it's got a great big donut though. Yeah. But yeah, it's one of those things where like when I moved to LA, I was like the big donut. The big donut. Yes. I'm going to go see the big donut. Uh -huh. It was like 45 minutes away from it's me. It's not close to anything except the airport. Yeah. And so I like, I had to drive to the big donut and I went and I ate the donut. I was like, I did it. I had the big donut. Yep. All right. I'll drive home. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. That's beautiful. I miss RIP Stans in Westwood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lovely little place. Is Stans related to the one in Chicago or no? No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't know about it. Do you know about Gold Belly? Oh. Yo. Layton sent me a Christmas gift from Gold Belly. Mystery bagels. That's my go-to. Like, I need to send something nice. I sent my dad Gold Belly yeah. for his father's. I, I ordered just recently Montreal bagels yeah. from Gold Belly from Saint Viature. Yeah, Gold Belly is the bougiest, weirdest thing in the world. So expensive. One of the things you can do is you can send people Stan's Donuts from Chicago and it's like wow. very famous and very good. So I sent some friends recently who just had a kid. I was like, here's some donuts. Oh, that's great. Um, what about you? Yeah, what are Thank your peaches? You. Uh, my three peaches. My first one is that I went to Aaron and Susie's over the weekend and it was lovely. We just watched dumb YouTube and we went on a nice long walk and we hung out on a playground and we swung on the swings, which I haven't done in forever. Oh, that's nice. So that was peach number one. And their cats like me now. It's taken so long for them to like be chill with me. And now even Otto, who's like the really standoffish one, will like come over for pets. My second peach is that I got my Instagram back. Yay. Yeah, I've been meaning to apologize to you for hacking it. Mm, uh, but, yeah. you know, you see an opportunity, you got to take it. Uh, it was a miserable week with absolutely zero help from Instagram. And then when I got back, a bunch of people had messaged the hacker like, hey, go find nudes and I'll pay for them if you find any. So that's been fucking me up all week. Very exciting. Yike. Yeah, the fact that it was more than one person and all of them messaged every day that I was hacked. Wait, and now that you have the account back, you can see exactly who was doing yeah. those messages, right? Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Blocked the shit out of yeah. them. Yeah. Anyway, so that was fun. Also, 
find nudes? Who the fuck would have nudes oh in your DMs? Oh, in your DMs. Yeah, like yeah. like perhaps she had DM'd somebody a nude on Instagram. Oh, I thought brilliant plan. I thought they would be like, you know, you can do a thing where you can like make private posts. Mm. For your just yourself, essentially. I thought that's what they meant. Oh. I was like, who would do that? Nobody. But DM no. things makes a lot more sense. Anyway, so that was cool. My third one is that now that we've been going to like outdoor bars and stuff, I bring maybe. And it used to be that she would be really like anxious going places in public. But now she is so sweet and so polite. She will either sit on my lap or the lap of whoever I'm with. If we get food, she sits perfectly. Oh. And everyone fucking loves her. Yeah, I bet. Like I was at a bar with a friend last night and the waitress who wasn't even our waitress just kept kept coming over to like pet her and be like, oh, you're so sweet. You're so soft. And it's like, yeah. Oh, I love it. That's great. Could not love that more. Anyway, those are my peaches and I'm so fucking hot. I feel like I'm going to die. So <laughs> let's end this episode. All right, Anthony. Yes. Thank you for being here. Of course. And coming back over me. after 14 months or whatever it was. It's been like a, eight weeks at the most, yeah. I think. Where can people find you? I am everywhere on the internet at a Carboni, except for Twitch, where I am at Anthony Carboni. Twitch, you cowards, it's mine. Give it back to me. Uh, I also have a morning show three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's video game pop culture news with my co-host Sage Ryan. You can find that on Pixel Circus, twitch.tv slash Pixel Circus. We also have a D&D &D campaign that we play there every Friday night called Failed Save. So Pixel Circus is a great place to be. And then my science comedy podcast with Jeff Kanata is called We Have Concerns, and that comes out every Friday. Fuck. Wow comprehensive mm -hmm. prolific man all right everyone thank you so much for being here yes and, uh look him right in the eyes and say it as usual uh stay safe and come hard that's the end of the podcast goodbye bye okay. how long do we smile we just hold it i'm gonna continue to hold it just hold it I'm done. And okay. nine Fuck. eight seven <sighs> Late and Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com. <laughs>